Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Another parable Jesus put before the crowds. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sold in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it has grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. to the greatest of all. 
The kingdom of God is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Okay, a little bit of the kingdom of God can have a bigger impact than we might expect. Those first hearing this parable, or at least the women hearing this parable, probably knew how big a measure of flour was and how little yeast was needed to make sure that all of it was leavened. The kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field, which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. <clears throat> the kingdom of God is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Okay, when I discover the kingdom of God, whether it's by accident or I'm looking for it and I actually find it, it is worth everything I already have. Everything. That's a lot. When I used the Godly Play curriculum in Pacifico, Godly Play had manipulables that you could put down for the kids to see to kind of illustrate the story. And in this story, you had little brown strips of felt, and so you made a square, and you put stuff in the middle, like food and a chair, and stuff so it was his home, right? And when you tell this story, one by one, you take those things out of that square. Mm -hmm. And then you take the pieces one by one and put them over here, and you hand it to the other person too. And what you end up with was the guy and the pearl. That's it. That's it. Even the little four-year-olds would say, but oh, where is he going to live? <laughs> and they were worried. <laughs> Everything. Everything. Now, did you notice that Jesus is speaking in the present tense? Not sometime in the future. <clears throat> now. The kingdom of God is. Is that how you think about the kingdom of God? Until the last few years, I thought about the kingdom of God as some place I was going someday and hopefully not too soon. <laughs> then some reading I did and some speakers I heard convinced me that the kingdom of God could be here on earth, or at least that it could be included here as well as somewhere else. So in my thinking, I changed the location. But you know what? I forgot to look at the timing. I still thought about the kingdom of God as something that was going to happen somewhere far into the future, something that would finally get here someday. And given the last few years, and given the news reports that I now hear day in and day out, the kingdom of God seems very far away. But Jesus makes it sound like the kingdom of God is already here. Really? So as I re-examine again what I believe about the kingdom of God, I have realized that what I have been thinking makes no sense. The way I have been thinking looked and sounded like this. One minute there's life on earth as we know it, and the next minute there's the kingdom of God. Kind of like, poof! Life on earth is now life in the kingdom of God. I guess that's a possibility, but it sounds more like magic than a loving and patient God who waits for each of us to make our own decisions and our own choices. So now, when I think about the dramatic difference between the kingdom of God and life as we know it right now, I think that what is far more likely than presto changeo is a gradual shift, maybe a very gradual shift, from one reality to the other. When Stina and I moved from the Bay Area to the Olympic Peninsula, there were a ridiculous number of changes we had to make and or endure throughout the process of sorting, packing, preparing the house for sale, actually selling it, finding a house up here, actually buying it, finding a moving company, closing out our time with our two congregations, saying a gazillion goodbyes, three days of 
driving two cars, two cats, and two dogs from California to Agnew, and finally, a month later, moving into our house. There was nothing immediate about any of that. It was a lot of work. I think maybe the kingdom of heaven is the same way. Now that I've moved away from my magic thinking, it makes sense to me that the emergence of the kingdom of God is much more like our move. The long-term work of leaving old familiar places and practices and adopting new practices based on new information about the kingdom of God. That new place that we have chosen to live. If I follow that line of thought, I begin to recognize that the changes needed to help the kingdom of God emerge are already occurring. <coughs> In fact, they have been occurring for years and years and years. Each and every person who has loved God, or who loves God now, or who will love God in the future, is a participant in the emergence of the kingdom of God, right here in Spain, or clear over in Beijing, or South Africa, or someone else halfway in between. Everyone who has, or was, or is now, or will be doing their best to be a faithful follower of the way of Jesus is contributing to the development of the kingdom of God every single day. Past, present, or future tense, here, there, or everywhere else. And that, of course, brings us to the part about change. Change is hard. Whether it's a change we want to be making or a change we would rather avoid, change is hard. Establishing new routines is hard. Getting used to a new permanent change is hard. Lucky for us, God is right in the middle of every change we make, and even then, change is hard. In the eighth chapter of Romans, and may I say, Steve, you did an amazing job reading it, Paul assures us that we have help managing the change that is necessary for our own growth and for expanding the kingdom of God. Because when you think about it, those are both kind of the same thing. Our growth helps the growth of the kingdom of God. It's kind of a package deal. That help that we need and that we have available to us all the time is the Spirit of God. That help is the Spirit of God supporting and guiding us every step of the way. That help is the Spirit of God who joins in our prayers and our petitions to God. When we run out of words or we're too upset to use the right words or maybe to think of any words at all, the Spirit of God speaks on our behalf, reiterating exactly what we were trying to say. Because we are never alone in any of this work. So let's tackle what can be a stumbling block even for deeply faithful people like us. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God. <coughs> Did you trip over it when you heard it? <laughs> I do, every single time, every single time. I wanna take out for those who love God because I believe that everything works together for good for everybody because it's the people who God loves not the people who love God. Here's a sample of the questions I've been asked about this sentence. What about the people who are killed by drunk drivers? Where's the good? What about deeply faithful people who are mugged or beaten or robbed at gunpoint? Where's the good? What about children who are molested by family members? Where's the good? What about veterans with PTSD who can't get help from the VA? Why should things work out for me, hateful people, when they don't work out for the good people? Why did my grandmother beat cancer only to die from COVID? Okay, the driver had a heart attack, so the crash wasn't really his fault. But why did my son die because some stranger has a health issue? <clears throat> My answer has always been the same. I don't know. 
I wish I had an answer that would help, but I don't. I don't have an answer at all. Then I usually hand the person a Kleenex and we have a good cry. This morning, I still don't have an answer. I don't even have stories about how I didn't know right then when I figured it out later. The best I can do is to say that those events are part of a journey. Those events are the places where the care and the concern and the compassion of friends and family and sometimes total strangers demonstrate the love of God in rich and meaningful ways. Ways that support and empower those who have lost so much and hurt so deeply. I began this sermon by announcing rather glibly the gospel reading tells us where we are fitted, headed. The passage from Roman tells us how we're going to get there. And Solomon had the good sense to ask for help. I hope we do too. We are on a journey of personal transformation, headed more and more deeply into the kingdom of God. Like Solomon, we have the good sense to recognize our shortcomings and our need for guidance, encouragement, and sustenance. Paul assures us that those needs are being met every step of the way, that we don't do any of this alone. He says, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, or things to come, or powers, or height, or depth, or anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I have one last offering for you, a blessing of sorts from Bishop Stephen Charleston. Be renewed in your spirit now. Let this prayer lift you up. Let it restore your strength and your energy, filling your soul with fresh hope, opening your vision to see the wonder that is your life. Be renewed in every part of your life, in mind and body and faith, so that the heaviness of your labors grows light. The waiting passes quickly. The problems suddenly seem so much smaller. Be renewed in your heart, knowing that the Spirit is with you, that angels walk beside you, that God is opening doors and calling you to follow. This is the time of your next birth, the passing from gray to light, the touch of a holy hand that will empower you with its anointing. May it be exactly that.